My name is Omar Farwadi. I'm a researcher with Forensic Architecture. And Forensic Architecture is a research agency, uh, university-based, that was founded in 2010, that undertakes spatial and media analysis of violence and violations. So we use our expertise as architects and visual practitioners to kind of assess and investigate buildings as evidence. The built environment holds kind of information about what we are doing in foreign countries. But we are not only architects. We have in our team uh, photographers, coders, investigative journalists, filmmakers, and we often collaborate based on the case with NGOs, human rights organizations, lawyers, and scientists. And the work of forensic architecture happens in our time because of two catalyzing phenomena of our modern time. The first is that the majority of, era, of, of the majority of wars that we see today are urban. They are occurring in cities and buildings are their targets. And so it becomes an opportunity for architects to kind of offer their expertise and to read buildings almost as witnesses, to interrogate and question them for newfound information about what has happened. But often we cannot go to those places of conflict, you know, as, as researchers uh, from abroad. So we rely on the second phenomena, which Kuhn kind of alluded to, which is that these conflicts are occurring in media-saturated environments in which every single kind of citizen equipped with their phone can directly transmit to us their testimony, their direct accounts. And often we see that it is sometimes a flooded, um, you know, footage of high volume. And we have to kind of organize and compare each piece of evidence we have. And we develop techniques such as um, in kind of cases of conflict called the architectural image complex in which we synchronize and place each of these things in a space and time virtual space right so we understand them in relation to each other and not anymore as single entities to be viewed in kind of a chaotic sense and then we begin to understand uh, kind of patterns and analysis much more clearly so today I'm going to be talking to you about two cases, the first one much more briefly in Pakistan and the other one uh, in Syria by coalition forces and a bit more in depth. Because sometimes the cases that we see are not, uh, are not so available in high volumes of footage. Sometimes there are media sieges. In this particular example, this was a kind of a piece of footage, a single piece of footage that was uh, smuggled out of North Waziristan in a town called Miran Shah in Pakistan, in which we see 40 seconds only of a particular place in which we suspect uh, a US airstrike, a drone strike took place. And at first we only see rubble, we don't know what kind of information we get, but looking closely we can even understand the condition of the person filming it. We even know that as they're filming it, they're very careful to be seen from the outside. They're kind of sitting back from the sill and only peeking in and out. And we also have footage you know, from, from an interior of a place and we do not know the connection of the interior and the exterior. But because we know this, this uh, evidence is so precious and we see kind of architectural indications of places of entry of missiles and bombs, very small holes in the ceilings of these places. And so we have to look at every single frame very carefully. And we must kind of, kind of uh, compare each one and extract as much information as possible. And so we look here first at the shadows of the place. Because even from the building that we are looking into, we see a north cast shadow. So we understand that actually we are standing in a building taller and, and, be, and kind of behind it, south of it, let's say. And then we also know that we are standing in a building higher to the one that we are looking onto, right? Just by comparing the window sill and, and the ceiling above it. <coughs> and then we can create a panorama because individual frames cannot very tell us very much. And so we kind of look at it as a comprehensive and total picture. And we see kind of patterns in the urban uh, infrastructure. We see a bend in the road on the left. And then we see a widening in the road on the right. 
we take those two pieces of information and we, we try to locate them as a, as a way of investigating more. So we look at kind of the urban fabric and we find indeed that there is a place in, with taller building to the south and a bend in the road and a widening in the road. So we want to ensure that we found the right place and so we corroborate. We see in the building a rounded kind of shape and a fanning in the beams and indeed we see that in the satellite image. But then we look for further for kind of uh, more clues and we see two buildings that are taller for it. One immediately in front of it and the other on the left. And so we are pretty certain that this is the location of where we are looking on from this windowsill, right? And then we go back to the interior and we immediately find that although these holes are very indicative of a, a possible airstrike, they fall under a kind of restriction of 50 by 50 centimeters, which was the maximum kind of a resolution that was available publicly at the time, and this is in 2012, of, uh, of satellite imagery, publicly available satellite imagery, mandated by law. And so we do not know in which pixel there has been an entry of a strike and a potential violation. Right? And just to illustrate this, we can see that a person kind of falls exactly under this module of 50 by 50 centimeters. And only in 2014 did they increase it uh, to become 31 by 31 centimeters, just under kind of the ability to detect a human body. And so we find other ways to locate this interior room. We create a 3D model and we look again at those shadows, but this time to understand them as dials. And we try to replicate the exact kind of condition and the, you know, the, the shape of the shadow to find an approximation of time. Of, of assuming, of course, that this is quite close to when the bombing happened. And so somewhere here we know that the interior of the room um, stands. And what we do then is kind of look for clues and how we can kind of correlate the time, what we know so far, the placement and the time of it, and we construct a panorama again to understand a pattern uh, throughout the room, and we find that the sunspots kind of shun from those holes in the ceiling can give us an indication about the rotation and orientation of the room within this building that we found. And so we do this <coughs> and we locate it, and we kind of have a better picture of that, and I'm not going into too much detail about the technical aspect of it, but then we look at very closely at the interior, and we, sign f we see fragmentation patterns, because we know a missile has exploded here. Right? So we study and analyze each particular kind of a fragment that was left by a steel shrapnel from a missile, and we notice that there are gaps, places of lower density that we suspect might be places where people have died, might be places where their bodies absorbed it instead of the architecture. So there's literally a direct reading of patterning on the architecture in itself into which we can kind of assess people. And we look at the kind of the the direction in which the wall was hit by this missile to assess where the missile landed. And by consulting uh, weapons experts and the pieces of fragmentation that we've looked at, we, we know exactly the type of missile that was used. And this is used very commonly by the coalition forces, a, um, a Hellfire missile, which is an architecturally precise strike, right? It penetrates with a delayed fuse concrete slabs and explodes on the inside to have the maximum impact of people as possible. So that's one case. And the other case was quite different. And we saw that on March 16th of last year in Syria, of many disputed claims. The first by civilians saying that people were dying, that people have died in mosques, uh, in which 300 people were gathering. And the other claim was saying that the US says, no, we've hit a community meeting hall where Al Qaeda terrorists were meeting. So this is a, a very clear indication of you know, one claim against the other. And this place, this happened in a town called Algina in rural Aleppo, in which we can see that a lot of footage was coming out very quickly. And in this particular case, we found a lot of footage, and some of it very shocking. In fact, the Syrian civil defense 
um, you can see here recovering the body of a boy, claims to have recovered the body of 38 civilians. <coughs> and immediately after the strike, the U.S. sent out a statement saying that U.S. forces conducted an airstrike on an Al-Qaeda in Syria meeting location in Idlib, Syria. Of course, the location is wrong here, and that they killed several terrorists. They released this image taken by the drone immediately after the strike, and they follow up after these claims, and they say, actually, <coughs> We deliberately did not target a mosque. The mosque is actually on the left edge of the photo, and we didn't hit it. And that our assessments indicate no civilian casualties. We surveyed this place very well. Well, okay, this presents a very simple architectural question. Was the place they hit a mosque? Right? So then we're kind of asking these questions. The second is, were there civilian casualties? Did we expect to find civilian casualties on a place like this? And how did the incident unfold in space and time? So we kind of corroborate these available images that they've provided, source imagery, videos, satellite images, survivor testimonies, and we begin to analyze the building before and after the strike. And we have identified two large craters, and these are consistent with reports that two 500 pound bombs were used on the north part of the building, and it was completely obliterated. And then we find a video posted two weeks or two months um, before the building was hit, and as we look for very basic kind of indications of what it was, we see first that there was a, a speaker that was used for the Adhan, a call to prayer, which on its own doesn't really show much. But we also see a very crude sign that says, Sayyidina Amr ibn al-Khattab Mosque, as people were claiming. But this is not enough, so we hire a local photographer to document the inside and the outside of the place, right? So we're looking for a very specific religious element that can identify, identify what kind of a building it was. And we see first that there's shoe racks, where people leave their shoes, very common in a mosque. But we, we need to look further. And so after reconstructing in a 3D model, we can also place in space uh, an image when we, should, we can see the mihrab, where the imam leads the prayer, and carpets on the ground, right? And places for storage also <coughs> for carpets. A very simple and common characteristics of a mosque. And we can conclude quite concretely that this was indeed a mosque. And then we have to kind of reconstruct what it was before. To understand the layout and the architecture of the building helps us to indicate whether we expect to find civilian casualties at all. Right, so we try to kind of go back to what it may be. And we speak and interview a local contractor who was responsible for building this, who was the caretaker of the mosque, and he himself was injured, and we conduct uh, kind of WhatsApp um, interviews in which we exchange architectural drawings and sketches <coughs> and, you know, voice clips to understand and corroborate what was happening. And we knew that there was an imam's flat on the second floor and a main prayer hall in the south, a ritual washroom, toilets, a kitchen, and a winter prayer hall. This is confirming many witness testimonies collected by Human Rights Watch as well. And so here, the mode of communication in, at times is not only by written or spoken testimony, but also by the architectural sketches in themselves, right? So I send him something and ask him questions. He sends me back corrections or his very specific measurements in which he was responsible for building this thing. So we were lucky, very lucky to be able to understand very precisely what was, what was there. So now that we understood what used to be, we wanted to understand what unfolded. And we know again, as I said, two bombs hit the northern part of the building. These two 500 pound bombs completely demolished the place. But afterwards, of course, a large number of people started to flee. And this is where the majority of the kind of casualties happened. And it was stated by an, an anonymous US official that four Hellfire missiles were used to specifically target people fleeing. And this is very strange. And we interviewed this uh, local um, leader of the, you know, the Syrian civil defense, known as the White Helmets, who was responsible for the rescue mission and for the mission of rescue in the area. And he says that there were 20 to 30 people scattered from the building to the, to the road. And it was very shocking. And so we wanted to find out where he pulled these people and we wanted to document this. And he indicated that these were the locations in which he pulled 11 injured people and that and then, then we see um, locations in which he pulled um, people that have died. 
And in this particular instance, he pointed to me a place in which he pulled out himself a child, and that this child uh, was 14, and that he later died of his injuries. And so we draw this, and we, we kind of map specifically where the people in the rubble correlate to places in the plan. And we know exactly, or as best as we can, which room they were in when, which, when this event happened. And we find and analyze markings on the road that indicate traces of Hellfire missiles also. Because there was like a very hard surface, we can see a direct patterning. And we consult kind of with, also with the fragmentations that we found and remains of these missiles, weapons, munitions, experts, and they confirm that this is likely the pattern of a Hellfire missile, which are very targeted, um, almost assassination tools. And just for scale and understanding, this is what it looks like. And four of these were used. And so after we do this investigation, we release a report and we also worked with Bell and Cat, and they release a report. And Human Rights Watch also releases a report. And we all kind of conduct these independent reports and we publish these. And upon publishing, I mean, before publishing, if you remember, the US said, we're not going to do an investigation because we've done our assessment and there doesn't seem to be any casualties. But after we, said, we released this report um, with those other organizations, said, fine, we'll look into it. We'll do an investigation, and they launch an official military investigation. And a month later, on May, we get this. And here they say, finally, that in fact what we have hit was part of a religious complex. Actually proving and talking to the people on the ground, work that we've done almost so that uh, work that they should have done that we've done as well in which they say that indeed the building that was hit was part of a religious complex and the language that they use was at times a mosque. So I think this kind of shows a very positive outcome in this case of us, like what it means to put pressure on governments for answers. We're simply asking questions of what was the use of the building that you said was a community meeting hall? Was it in fact that? Do we expect to find civilians in this case? I mean, if it's, just, if it's a mosque that was in use and we're 300, with a capacity of over 300 people, we do expect civilians to be there. And so by consistent and persistent pressure from civilian organizations and kind of putting in your own expertise and crowdsourcing this information, we are able to, um, as much as we can, put this to the public and in some cases get responses back. Thank you very much.